Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association. Connecting alumni to the university and to each other, the Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location in the Hub Robeson Center. Improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. And from viewers like you, thank you. What makes Americans feel most ashamed or most hopeful? What worries Americans most? In this edition of Digging Deeper, Penn State President Eric Barron will explore what a new poll is revealing about the U.S. electorate. Here to talk about that with him is Michael Berkman, director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and Eric Plutzer, director of the McCourtney Mood of the Nation poll. I'll be back later in the show to talk one-on-one -on -one with President Barron about the importance of voting and Penn State's upcoming Global Entrepreneurship Week. Now, here's President Barron. Michael and Eric, thank you so much for being here. I, I really uh, appreciate it very much. So the McCourtney Institute for Democracy was established in 2012. Correct. Why was it established? What, what's the mission? Well, the McCourtney Institute is located in the College of Liberal Arts, and we're an interdisciplinary unit uh, committed to the research, teaching, and public outreach on a variety of issues of democracy. And really, it came about from urging of many of our alumni mm -hmm. who were concerned about the state of American democracy, were speaking with us, people in the dean's office, about what liberal arts might be able to do to address it and teach about it. And that's how, we, that's how it was developed in the first place. And, and Eric, one of, the, one of the parts of the McCourtney Institute is, uh, is something called the Mood of the Nation Poll, mm -hmm. a first of its kind. Uh, how is that different from a traditional political poll? Well, as, as you know, there are hundreds, thousands of horse race polls. And you can open up the newspaper or go to your social media feed every day and get poll updates almost by the hour. Um, polling, I think, is a very important component for an institute like McCourtney because it is part of the democratic mission. Polls are inherently democratic if they are done correctly. All individuals have an equal chance of having their voices heard, but we didn't think we needed another horse race poll. And so um, with all the talk about the nation's mood being critical in the last few elections, people characterized the 2008 election as one moved by hope. Um, during the, these uh, recent primaries, uh, anger. I was associated with uh, both the uh, Trump supporters and Bernie Sanders supporters. And so we aimed to design a poll that would allow ordinary Americans to speak in their own terms about how they are feeling about the political system and the events which they have heard uh, on the news. And so our poll is unique in having a series of open-ended questions that allow ordinary citizens to tell us what's on their mind rather than select from three or four choices that a pollster might. So how did this idea come about that to create this, this type of new poll? Well, within the Center for American Political Responsiveness, we, we had been talking about uh, having a poll for a couple of years because we were actually around before McCourtney, before we were brought into McCourtney. Uh, uh, but we knew we didn't want to do what others were doing. We also have some uh, real academic strengths in uh, liberal arts, in uh, textual analysis and big data analysis. And so we were thinking that we wanted to leverage those as well. And so this was giving us an opportunity to think about something different mm -hmm. that would take advantage of those strengths. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's how we got it going. So now if, if, you, if you were to take this poll, what people would be used to is if you took a typical poll, you'd be used to saying you prefer this candidate or this issue. Mm -hmm. And what kind of language are you using? I, I understand yeah. it's words like hopeful and what are you ashamed right. of? So right. how did you develop this language? Um, well, we developed it from looking at, at some prior research, looking at the emotions that other political scientists have identified as being critical um, in determining um, uh, vote choice and political participation. 
And so we lead off the poll with a positive emotion because we didn't want to be strictly negative. And we ask people, uh, what is it in American politics today um, that makes you proud? Mm -hmm. And half of the sample, uh, instead of being asked about politics, get asked about what's been in the news that makes you proud. And then they're asked, um, how proud does that make you feel? So we have a traditional poll question afterwards to get at intensity. Mm -hmm. And then they cycle through questions uh, from what makes you proud, what makes you angry, what makes you hopeful, what makes you ashamed. And then everybody at the end is asked to think about the next 12 months and what in our society makes them worried. Uh, so we're looking ahead. And some of our respondents uh, have one word answers, you know, what makes you angry? And it, they might just write Trump, maybe in capital letters. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they'll write Hillary. Um, everything. But um, <laughs> some people write everything. <laughs> yeah. um, mm. But um, many of them write long, expansive answers, which are, are very interesting to read. They will talk about um, the, the political system, what they see as a decline in morals. Um, they will reflect on recent events that have been in the news, events of, of domestic violence, of terrorism, uh, events in the election, and it allows us to get a handle on what ordinary Americans are thinking about rather than pigeonholing them into a series of categories. Mm -hmm. So how do you analyze something when you have such a diverse set of words that might be using? Yeah, using? Well, how do you... It, it's, Box that up into. That's a challenge. It's a challenge, <laughs> and we 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 involve uh, both undergraduates and, and graduate students, and we are hoping to work towards a system that is uh, uh, leverages some of the new developments in big data analysis and textual analysis. But right now, we're doing it more or less the old-fashioned way. As we pour over, we get about five thousand open-ended responses in each wave, and um, we have developed a series of categories. So we begin with broad categories like social conditions, and then we have subcategories like the economy and crime and so on. Uh, we have a broad category uh, referring to political actors, so that refers to the individual candidates, to the parties, to their supporters, um, to particular interest groups, and then we can break those down as well. Um, right now, it's not surprising that, especially on the negative side, most people are um, focused on the campaign, that the campaign is at the top of their, their minds, both on the positive emotions and on the negative emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but it, that's not the only thing that people are concerned about. So if, and you have two different types of ballots, so one is asking what people are right. feeling, and one with the news. If you're coming up to an election like we're doing, are the answers different? Uh, well, the, the one in the news might tap something that is, uh, well, outside of politics. So, for example, the uh, protest by the football player Kaepernick on not kneeling during the, uh, during the uh, Star Spangled Banner. That attracted a great deal of attention in the news question, but that doesn't come up in politics at all. Uh, but there, there is obviously a lot of overlap because people are just focused on the election uh, more than almost anything else right now. So now one thing that since we're talking about mood and how people mm -hmm. uh, feel and reactions, do you assess whether someone's Republican and, or Democrat or independent? And if you do, do you see differences in mood and what they're proud of? Uh, yes, we do. We, we collect a variety of demographic information and political information. So we do know their, uh, we know their vote choice and we know their party identification, uh, along with uh, other information about them. Uh, one thing that strikes us, I mean, sure, Clinton supporters and Trump supporters obviously are angry about different things, usually the other person's candidate or the other person's supporters, perhaps. Uh, but also we see really some very interesting differences ab about how, say, Democrats and Republicans view the same incident. And mm. uh, uh, in uh, so the polarization we hear about among American political elites, we actually see it in some pretty interesting ways among the public and how they respond to, uh, as I was talking about before, the Kaepernick incident or the Orlando shooting. We were in the field right after the Orlando uh, terrorism incident, and we had very different responses from Democrats. So can you... Can you give some some mm -hmm. example? If you take the Orlando incident itself, 
what were some of the differences yeah. that you saw? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things is that when we asked about what makes you proud, mm -hmm. both Democrats and Republicans used language like coming together, helping out. But then as you dug deeper, there were important differences. So Democrats tended to focus on the support for the LGBT community from all over the world. Um, Republicans tended to not use those terms. They would focus on first responders, on people who donated food, um, blood donors, um, and um, hardly mentioned at all that the victims of this attack um, were primarily gay Americans. Um, so even on an event that seemed to bring people together, uh, the ability for people to expand on their initial answer ended up revealing differences. differences. Um, and the Orlando incident then tapped into deeper anger with Republicans saying that the Democrats were taking advantage of this tragedy in order to press for their uh, uh, efforts to limit the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so even events which on the surface seem to provide some unity and then, as you go on, revealed important differences between the, the parties. And so, uh, as Michael said, the polarization that we see among candidates is reflected very much in the same language mm -hmm. as trickling down to ordinary citizens. Now, I, um, I'm probably an oddball as an independent because uh, I'm the president of a public university and it seems to me to have very little value for me to <laughs> be picking sides other than the university's side. Mm -hmm. But are independents stand out differently in this as well? Um, the independents are a little less intense um, overall. Uh, those um, who are um, there are very, very few passionate independents, and you may be an exception yeah. <laughs> uh, to this, but um, uh, the independents tend to be a little less involved. Uh, they tend to read uh, the newspaper less often, and so they were more likely to say that, gee, I can't think of anything that makes me proud, or I can't think of anything that Interesting. That, uh, right. That's fascinating. makes me ashamed. Um, and also interesting is that uh, young voters those who have yet to sort of solidify their identification with one political party or another seem to manifest some of the same patterns. So mm -hmm. those who are under 30 years old um, were, um, they were the most likely to say, well, I, I can't really think of anything that worries me, or mm. I can't think of anything that makes me proud or hopeful. And so it was, um, they have a sort of distance from the fiery debates and the, the anger. Mm. And uh, we suspect that's because young people are exploring their political identity. They haven't, they may identify as a Democrat or Republican, but it is not. Solidified yet. Is not solidified yet. And so the young people look a little bit like independents, even if they have a party affiliation. Mm. How do you know you sense the mood? You have confidence in the numbers and mm -hmm. and and how you balance demographics and well, we're certainly confident about the sample mm -hmm. and uh, do a variety analysis about the sample mm -hmm. and weight the sample so that we have a nationally representative sample. Uh, and I'd say you know a lot of the answers that we're getting in this type of uh, format are consistent with what you see in, in other sorts of polling and what we know about differences between Democrats and Republicans and about. American politics uh, more generally. Again, after people give an answer, we ask them ab about how strongly they feel about it. And mm -hmm. it, it's quite clear that the people, who, when they say, what makes you angry? They say, how angry does that make you? Say, it makes me really angry. And mm -hmm. they say, well, what makes you, what gives you hope? And they say, well, the democratic system uh, gives me hope, or Hillary's candidacy gives me hope. Um, and, uh, and say, how hopeful does that make you? Well, they might give it a, a two or a three on our, right. our four-point yeah. scale. And so when we look at the electorate as a whole, um, we can both read the answers but also quantify the answers. And, and the mm -hmm. mood is very sour. There's and not a lot of hope out there, right? We, what we don't know is whether um, during earlier epochs when we weren't polling, um, during the civil rights era, for example, uh, when uh, Americans had great technological achievements, uh, like putting a man on the moon, um, during uh, periods when peace treaties were signed, 
you know, whether the mood of the nation would have been more positive. And so we're looking forward to polling into the future. Uh, hopefully, um, we will see um, some variation. And, and mm -hmm. with any luck, we're at, at the very bottom of the cycle right now. And what, What's the time frame that you've been doing this so that you can see how it evolves? Uh, we did a poll in June. And we did a poll again in September. Uh, we're going to do a poll again in uh, after the election. And then I imagine going forward, we're probably talking about four or five polls a year. Uh -huh. uh, they're labor intensive to analyze the data when I they bet. come in. Uh, and then you also, you just never know when you're in the field what might happen mm -hmm. during that week that's going to dominate what's going on in the poll. That's what happened with the Orlando shooting on the, uh, on mm -hmm. the June poll. It'll be very interesting to see after the election. You, know, you often think of uh, a post-election period of one of high optimism in the public, of hopefulness, of moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of why, personally, the uh, talk about election results per perhaps not being accepted is... Uh, concerning. It will be interesting to mm -hmm. see how people are responding mm -hmm. to that kind of situation. So now, one of the other things you said is that you look, you look into the future 12 months. So is this sense of op lack of optimism projected into that 12 months? What are, what are people expressing on a 12-month basis other than just being surrounded by an election that has an immediacy in the news and some of the other events? Well, I think most people have, have put their hopes in their candidate. Yeah. Uh, so that that is clear. Beyond that, um, what we find is, is a sizable number of people are worried about terrorism. Yes. Um, that um, tends to be especially true of older Americans. Um, younger Americans are express greater concern about the economy and and jobs. Um, and um, the, um, and so once the election is over, I think we'll see a variety of concerns come to the top of the head uh, for our respondents. And um, looking forward to see what people are worried about after um, the election day in November. Yeah, I'd add that you see concerns with the tone of the election, the mm. divisiveness, will America be healed, how are we going to come together? Mm. Uh, there are references to intolerance, to division, uh, to fighting, and uh, so that comes up in, in various types of answers, actually, but in, in worry as well. What are some of the most surprising things that you've, you've seen? Are, are there any that you've kind of tacked up on your wall because they're, <laughs> they're that good? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I'm surprised, but I'm taken aback by the nastiness sometimes mm -hmm. of the responses, uh, things people will write that I'm not sure they would say to a live interviewer, um, and that don't necessarily come through in a, in a close. Um, I think we were, you know, we've been intrigued by the extent to which the uh, electorate is polarized on all kinds of things, that just Democrats and Republicans just often are seeing the world in, in some different ways. Yeah, so we did a, a pretest in February immediately after the oh, right. Super Bowl, yeah. and we had not preset a category for Beyonce and her halftime Show. Yeah, it came up quite a bit. And it came up quite a bit. <laughs> really? It came up yeah. on, on, uh, uh, on, among Democrats and, and African Americans uh, saying that her allusions to uh, Black Lives Matter um, uh, gave them pride. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, on the conservative side, uh, there was anger that she had used that forum to advance these issues. They felt that the Black Lives, it gave them an opportunity to speak about how they felt the Black Lives Matter movement was disrespectful to our law enforcement personnel. And so ordinary citizens pick up on little symbolic events that they see in the news, in the mass media, in sports, and project their deepest feelings, their hopes and fears onto those events, not just the political campaign. Mm -hmm. But no thought in that projection 12, 12 months in advance that this, this polarity is something that we can escape. I, I see nothing in there that would, mm -hmm. would suggest that. I think this has developed over, over many years. So can you just describe what is the value of this data beyond the election and, and thinking about doing this year after year? what you see the value? Uh, yes, as, as we talked about earlier, uh, we wish we would have been in the field years ago so that we could come up with some comparison. And so we certainly hope to develop a time series of the mood of the nation that we can track 
over time. Um, and in addition, this trove of data will be available to all of our students, our graduate students, our undergraduate students, to write theses, to dig down deeper than we are able to do on a, a short polling timeline. Um, uh, there are, we have terrific graduate students who are involved in the automated analysis of text, um, and they want to crack at the data, and we have undergraduate thesis writers who can dig down into a particular theme and maybe pull answers from one month to another month, another month, and pool them together. And so we're very excited about this being uh, something that we'll use in, in classrooms and uh, for research, too. If you had in just a couple of words to express your feelings in the same way of your poll about the future, what would you say? I would say that uh, I am concerned about some of the recent language about the legitimacy of the election, and especially in my position with the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, that's, uh, this is a cornerstone of democratic elections. Yeah, and I, I, I would say the same thing. I think what we do not see, with just a few exceptions on either side, is, is we don't see uh, statesmanlike uh, behavior uh, of people willing to criticize their own side uh, as a way of elevating uh, the level of, of discussion. Is that yeah. We don't have the Howard Bakers on either side mm -hmm. right now, and uh, we need people to step up from all parts of life. Well, thank you both for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, of course, very timely, uh, fascinating topic. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, so our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for your interest in it. Next up on Digging Deeper, I'll talk one-on-one -on -one with President Barron about entrepreneurship and innovation at Penn State. Dr. Barron, election night is fast approaching and for many students, this is their first time voting. Why is it so important for them to vote? You know, I think there are lots of answers to that, to that question. One is, it, it's just fundamental for democracy. Um, I happen to think uh, democratic form of governance is the best form of governance in, uh, in the world, but it doesn't work if everybody doesn't vote. Uh, it's also interesting to look at it from the perspective of our guests and their polls because a population that is voting and voting in larger percentages is an elderly population, somebody that would fit more of the characteristics um, of, of me. And their mood poll suggests that that's a population that's more worried about the future. And so if you start to think about that for a little while, it becomes really important to have this um, young population that has uh, uh, perhaps a very different perspective about the world, who's forming their ideas about what the future will be like, and they're really voting for their future. And so that seems to me another incredibly important reason why that's a population that should be voting. Speaking of the election, innovation and job creation have been in the forefront lately. And Penn State's annual Global Entrepreneurship Week is coming up. What happens during this week? So I, you know, it, I think it's, um, I think I'd like to describe it in terms of the wor words like innovation and exciting and a lot of fun and a lot of teamwork and a lot of people pitching ideas and uh, competitions that, that are there. And all of that is taking truly the creative juices of our students and, and putting it out there as a, as a potential company or a potential idea, social entrepreneurship, uh, a startup. And um, I think it's one of those moments at a university where uh, you can focus all that creativity and out comes what could be a great set of innovations and a great set of companies. So I guess I'd describe it as just pure fun to go sit there and watch and, and participate in. The other thing I think is wonderful is our students combine in so many different ways in order to have an idea work and have the potential, um, the potential to be a successful company. Have you ever considered starting a business yourself? You know, when I was in high school, there was something called junior achievement. I don't know whether we still have junior achievement, but y you had to create an idea that you would go market. 
and it was to get a sense of business and sense of an idea to market. Not quite so innovative in sitting there and thinking that I'm uh, this is a startup. I didn't didn't hear words like that. Much much more focused on can I get business sense and market a, market a, a product. Um, so I can't say that I have, but I wonder if I was a modern student today, whether I would be looking at something like the Entrepreneurship Week and saying, I gotta be there. This week is about innovative spirit. Are you excited about any new innovations at the university? You know, every single time I turn around, there's another innovation. We just had uh, a venture capital fair with over 60 ideas that were being a pitch that were coming from our faculty and there weren't 10 that were fantastic there were dozens that were fantastic and and just show you how how bright our faculty are and how much they want to really contribute to society so i couldn't name one there are dozens thank you dr Barron. my pleasure on behalf of penn state president eric Barron, we'd like to thank our guests Michael Berkman, director of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, and Eric Plutzer, director of the McCourtney Mood of the Nation Poll. I'm Michelle Wolf. Thanks for joining us. Support for Digging Deeper comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, connecting alumni to the university and to each other. The Alumni Association is powered by pride. Learn more at alumni.psu.edu. The Penn State Bookstore, now in an expanded location in the Hub Robeson Center. Improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support for student causes throughout the university. And from viewers like you, thank you.